First of all, we need to address this situation. It was a fringe. It's no longer a fringe. I'm going to have to sort that out at some point. Anyways, welcome to Serena Speaks. And today we're going to go over some of the low weighted topics of the pharmacy exam, pharmacy pre-reg exam. Now, I'm not referring to the low weighted topics in the BNF. I mean the general low weighted topics that could crop up. Now, the low weighted section makes up um, up to 10% of the exam. And so it can be tempting to just skim over it and not bother looking at it. But that's risky because it could be the difference between passing and not passing the exam. Because actually the low weighted topics are easier to understand, easier to get your head around. And so in essence, they're easy marks. So don't be tempted to skim over it. Um, what I've done is I've printed out and got in front of me the GPHC framework um, that goes over the low weighted topics. So what I thought would be best way to tackle this is to go through each of the sections in turn. There's about 12 and any reference resources that I mention, I will put them in the little description box below and with all the hyperlinks and everything, including the GPHC framework in case you haven't had a chance to look at that just yet. So. Let's start off with number one. So number one says, <clears throat> recognise the duty to take action if a colleague's health, performance or conduct is putting patients or the public at risk. So what this is referring to is our um, GPHC standards and guidance on um, our general standards and guidance documents. So in particular, we know we have seven GPHC principles and this particular section is referring to number two of that, which is to use your professional judgment in the interests of patients and the public and to be, pre be prepared to challenge the judgment of your colleagues. This particular section could also entail you to know how to um, escalate your concerns or voice your concerns. So that would refer to the document entitled um, Guidance on Raising Concerns. So for example, say you are concerned about a particular colleague's performance or you don't think they're behaving in the correct manner, then it's important to look at what your organisation's policy is. You may need to then escalate it to your supervisor and with everything that you do, remember to document it. Keep a document of what was said, who's involved, um, I mean, you might need to anonymise sometimes who's involved. Again, it depends on your organisation's policy and important document what action was taken. So have a look at those two documents. As I mentioned, I'll put them in the description link below. So now the second section on the GPHC framework for low weighted topics talks about applying the principles of clinical governance into practice. So first and foremost, we need to know what the definition for clinical governance is. So boom. Here's our definition. And the important thing to take away from it is that it's a framework and it's about continually improving um, the services that we provide and safeguarding. Now, there are seven key principles for um, clinical governance, and I've included a link to the PSNC website, which goes into those seven principles in a little bit more depth. But in summary, so number one is about patient and public involvement. So for example, distributing out satisfaction surveys. So how are patients um, finding the services that we're providing? It's about producing practice leaflets as well. Number two is about clinical audit. So every year you will have to do two audits, one of which would be organised internally. So, for example, if you're finding that you're having to give out a lot of owings, it's about looking at the process of when a prescription comes in, when is that stock being ordered, do you have sufficient space for that stock, and how can you improve your services? Remember the definition, it's about improving, continually improving. So how can we improve our services so that we're not having to give out as many owings, as an example? Number three is about risk, man risk management. And as written in the um, GPHC framework, they want you to really know about risk management. So definitely make sure that you look more into that particular section in the PSNC um, link that I've included in the description box. So for example, if an instance does occur, 
who do you have to report it to? Um, what do you have to record? How can you minimise risk? So looking at how are you handling stock? Are you carrying it in the most appropriate way? Are you handling it in the most appropriate way? Number four is about clinical effectiveness. So for example, um, are we giving the best self-care advice to patients? Number five is about staff and staff management. So when you have new staff or you have locums coming in, are they being trained appropriately? Are they being shown the SOPs as an example? Number six is about education, training and continual professional development, so our CPDs. And number seven is about use of information to support clinical governance and delivery of our services. So, for example, we have access to the latest BNF, the latest MEP, the latest drug tariff. So it's about being able to access those, that information and deliver and tailor the delivery of our services to best meet the requirements of our patients. So number three says to demonstrate how the science of pharmacy is applied in designing and developing medicines and services and looking at what factors can affect stability. So if you think about, for example, flucloxacillin, so whether it's capsules or liquid, you'll notice that it's always contained inside a silver foil. Whereas if you look at something like amoxicillin, it's just, it's just in a box, there's no silver foil. What's the reason for that silver foil? Well, it's to protect the flucloxacillin from light because light affects its stability. And the same way you get medication that is in amber, amber um, glass bottles, because again, it's trying to protect the medication from light. pH, oxidation, humidity, again, these can all affect stability. You have the aseptics unit in a hospital to prevent contamination, because again, if something becomes contaminated, that can affect stability as well. And temperature. So chloramphenicol eye drops need to be kept in the fridge, whereas the ointment can be kept outside. So that section also looks at procedures for the dilution of solid, semi-solid and liquid dosage forms. And what my understanding of that is, um, for example, if you have antibiotics, you have a powdered antibiotic, you need to make it up with water to make it that liquid form. So you might need to add 82 mils of water or 84 mils of water to make sure that you get the correct strength of that particular antibiotic as an example. Another example could be diluting one part of a concentrated product with 10 parts of water. For example, um, in some products that you have to gargle, it needs to be diluted down with water first. So that's, that's what I understand from, or that's what I gather from what that section is asking for. Number four looks at recording, maintaining and storing patient data. So what this involves is looking at consent, confidentiality, information governance, and storing of protected data. So, consent and con confidentiality. Look at the document entitled um, Guidance on Consent, because in order to gain consent from someone, you need to assess their capacity. So what do we mean by that? We mean, do they understand the information that we are providing? Can they weigh up the options? Um, are they able to tell you what their informed decision is? Um, are they able to understand what it is that you're explaining to them? And consent, consent, confidentiality is very important that you do get consent from that patient and you find in some situations where you're not able to get consent directly from the patient. For example, if they're a child or if they're brain damaged or if there is a language barrier, it can make it quite difficult. So make sure to check out that document. Let's look at information governance. So information governance ties in with confidentiality. Say, for example, um, the police comes to you and they say, we know that patient B um, comes to this pharmacy. Um, they've been involved in an incident and we need to know what um, medication they're on. You don't have to give the police that information because you're bound by confidentiality to not give out that information. In situations like this, you'll need to ask the, the police to give you something called a Section 29 form. If they present with a Section 29 form, then you can give out that information. But without that form, without that presenting, them presenting that form to you, you're not obliged to give out that information because you are bound by confidentiality. 
What else does information governance involve? Well, for example, making sure that you don't take um, patient data home. So, for example, their prescriptions or their discharge letters, making sure that um, you dispose of their information uh, in the correct way. So using shredders, using confidentiality bins, not just using, you know, general waste. Um, another example is say a mum comes in for her medication and you see that um, that patient's daughter's medication is also ready and waiting to be collected. And it's, for example, the contraceptive pill. Don't then say to that mum, by the way, your daughter's medication is here. Do you want to pick that up for her as well? Because you haven't got consent from the daughter for the mum to pick that medication up. Now, if the mum came in and she said, oh, I'm picking up mine and my daughter's medication, that's a different situation because you know that, OK, the daughter has given consent for her mum to pick up the medication. But you yourself can't suggest to that mum, oh, by the way, do you want to pick up your daughter's medication as well? because they haven't given that consent. Another example is your NHS smart card. Don't give your password to your NHS smart card to anyone. Because for example, say um, you've done the course for summary care records, your smart card is your key to access the summary care records. And if somebody else knows your password, they could potentially then use your smart card to access information which is confidential and which they're not really allowed to access. So, don't give out your password to anyone. And that all comes under information governance and in terms of recording and storing data. So for example, your CD records, your RP records, how long you need to keep those records in the pharmacy, how long you need to store those um, documents and that data for. Number five looks at ensuring the quality of ingredients to produce um, medicines and products. So that's why we have the FDA. So they will ensure that any medicines that end up on our shelves meet those set, set criteria and requirements. It also says quality, looking at quality assurance processes for medicines and ingredients and storage requirements for medicines and ingredients. So again, storage requirements, think back to stability. So it doesn't need to be kept in the fridge. Can it be kept at room temperature, for example? Number six is very similar. It says to procure and store medicines and other pharmaceutical products working within a quality assurance framework. So again, looking at storage of medicines, um, making sure to counsel patients of any additional storage that may be required. So again, for example, if you have your powdered amoxicillin, you add it up with water and you need to then keep it in the fridge. So making sure that medicines are being stored in the, in the most effective and best way. Um, otherwise it can affect, for example, its stability. So number seven looks at disposal of medicines safely, legally and effectively. So disposing of unwanted medicines is an essential service that pharmacies provide. I know most pharmacies that I've worked in, the one thing that they will not accept back is sharps, so needles, for example. So make sure to let your patients know of that um, if it is something that you don't provide. And that it's usually the council who organises the removal of sharps waste. But tablets and such likes, those we can um, accept back. And in the MEP, they have pages and pages on how to safely dispose of certain medication. For example, with some liquids, it's not safe to pour them down the drain. So a much more effective way is actually to mix it with cat litter and then the cat litter will absorb it all and then you can dispose of it that way. If it's a CD, then you need to use the specially designed CD destruction kits in order to, in order to get rid of and dispose of the CD, the controlled drug medication. And it also involves medicines optimization. So as part of medicines optimization, we want to try and reduce the amount of medical waste that there is. Now, you will find sometimes that when patients are bringing back um, unused medication, they have bags and stocks and stock of unused medication. And you think to yourself, why did you request this medicine every month or every two months when you have a backlog of them? And secondly, why do you have a backlog of them? Aren't, are you not using this medication? Were you not using it effectively in the best way? So when a patient is handing you back a whole load of medication, make sure to check they are using that medication and that they are using it in the, in the right way. And also, um, 
if they are handing back lots and lots of medication, then when you're requesting their medication, say every month or every two months, double check they do need that medication and that they're not just hoarding it at home, for example. Point number eight says to identify, report and prevent errors and unsafe practice. So it's about following your company's SOPs. Do those SOPs maybe need to be updated in order to prevent those particular errors? Do you have near miss incident logs that you can put, put down what the near miss error was and what you've learned from it and how you can prevent it next time round? It also relates back to point two, so clinical governance, um, risk management, what procedures are in place to try and reduce potential risk and errors being made. Number nine says to procure, store and dispense and supply vet medicines safely and legally. So again, the MEP has a whole section on um, veterinary medicines. I've also included a link in the description box from the Royal College of Veterinary and Surgeons, which provides a bit more advice and guidance. And number 10 says to demonstrate the characteristics of a prospective professional pharmacist as set out in relevant codes of conduct and behaviour. So again, that's looking back at our point number one. So the GPHC 7, our key seven principles, is a prospective pharmacist following those seven principles? Um, are they making sure that patients are at the heart of their decision? Making sure that they are following the guidance and the standards and the SOPs that are in place. So number 11 looks at um, participating in an audit and trying to um, recommend where improvements can be made. So this again looks at point number two, so our clinical governance and within clinical governance, we need to do a clinical audit and looking at our audit cycle. So first and foremost, at the top of our cycle, it will be to identify where there is a problem. So um, as I said beforehand, for example, giving out too many owings, that's, that's what the problem, that's the problem that we have identified. Then you want to agree um, what standards and what criteria should be met. Number three, you're going to collect all that data. And number four, you're going to analyse that data and see where improvements can be made. After doing that, you then want to instigate those improvements and make those changes. And then the last stage would be in about three to 12 months time, doing a re-audit. So seeing that after those changes have been made, has there actually been an improvement in service? Remember, clinical governance is all about improvement and continually improving services being made. And number 12 says to contribute to the development and support needs of individuals and teams. So this could include looking at our standards of conduct, ethics and performance, particularly point number five, which says to develop our knowledge and our competence for example, through CPDs. So making sure that we identify the learning needs of our team members and helping help to support them with their develop, developmental needs. So those are our low weighted topics that the exam could potentially ask upon. Um, but remember, we're not just learning for the exam, we're learning to be better pharmacists as well. So everything in these low weighted topics you might need to use in real life anyway, um, especially when you are practicing as a pharmacist, especially when it comes to, you know, clinical governance, medical op medicines optimization, um, clinical audits, you will need to know all of that. And we're not just learning for the exam, we are learning to be better pharmacists as well, so that when we start as a day one pharmacist, we're fully prepared um, with what we are faced with. So don't be tempted to skip over the low weighted topics. Um, make sure to have a look at the reference resources that I've included in the description link. And hopefully you found this video useful. And if you did, why not give us a big thumbs up? Give us a like, share, subscribe, comment. I really do appreciate all the lovely comments and messages that you do give and send to me. So thank you so much for doing that. And join us on Facebook if you haven't already. Um, follow me on Twitter at Serena Speaks. And until next time, good luck with your revision and happy revising.